Hello, James Flotten here with the Minnesota Space Grant to talk a little bit about using spot trackers for stratospheric ballooning. So here is a spot tracker. It says spot on the case. This happens to be called a spot trace. And for example, here's another spot tracker. This is a spot Gen 3. It's bigger, it's more expensive, it's fancier, and it's not as good. I'll tell you why in a moment. Spot trackers are are used by, by hikers, for instance, and also to track assets like valuable things or boat or something. You can hide one of these on it, and then you'll be able to look up on the internet where it's located because it has a GPS, so it knows its location, and it has a connection to satellites, so it can tell the satellite network where it's located. This particular one updates once per five minutes. It's a subscription device, and you can subscribe to different update rates. Once per five minutes or once per 10 minutes is fairly typical. Um, the spot trace actually works at all altitudes reached by stratospheric ballooning. The spot Gen 3, on the other hand, actually stops transmitting at 80,000 feet. It will transmit below 80,000 feet on the way back down, but you'll miss the middle of the flight if you go higher than 80,000 feet. And the extra bells and whistles that allow you to send messages to it and through it aren't that useful if you're not there because it's on a balloon after all. So spot trace, definitely the way to go. The device comes with a clip. And so the idea is you put it in the clip. And the way I like to actually mount these, I'd like to tell you how I use them. And then I'll show you how to set one up. You only have to set it up once and then you can use it. But the user part is the more interesting part as far as I'm concerned. So here I have a parachute from a recent flight that was tied below a balloon. That's what's left of the balloon. And notice there's a spot trace attached to the very peak of the parachute. Um, actually, it's the clip that's attached to the parachute. And so I taped in the tray so it wouldn't fall out of its own clip. But in this particular case, this device has a pretty good view of the sky, both on the way up and also on the way down, or at least of the horizon, which seems to be OK. Um, and if it, this were to land in a tree or in a cornfield or something like that, typically the parachute is the last thing to disappear and quite possibly won't disappear altogether, leaving the spot close to the surface of the foliage. If you bury this really deeply in a cornfield, sometimes you can't talk to it or it can't talk to satellites. So um, based on my experience, it's not so necessary to hold it in a gimbal and hold it perfectly upright. That's probably a fine thing to do, but I think it's not totally necessary. I have good luck just putting them at the peak of my parachutes on my flight. To turn the device on, you press the single button. There's a button on the top, and if I press the button, it starts flashing two different lights. That means turn on. And then eventually it stops flashing. It will flash a few lights for a while. That probably means I'm in the process of getting a lock. And then once it's fully turned on, I don't think it really flashes hardly ever. So it's sometimes hard to tell if the thing is on or off. But if you were to press the button again and it flashes only one light rather than two, if I can do that, it's a hard press, there we go. One light flashing rapidly, that means I'm turning myself off. So there it was turned on, turned off. When you first turn it on, I think it's a good idea to give it a shake. The reason is it's got accelerometers in it to tell it whether it's moving or not. And if it's not moving, it tends not to transmit as often or possibly not at all. Um, and so you kind of have to wake it up sometimes. I've never verified this, but I was told once that if you press it, the button and don't move it, it might think it's not moving and not transmit. That would be a bad, bad thing to happen. So let's take a look at a sample website. When you're using the device, what you want to do is you want to set up what's called a shared view so that uh, whoever's watching it, you have, a, you have an account and you can look up what's going on with your device on your account, but you don't want to give out your account credentials to just anybody. So what you should do is you should set up a shared view and then that link will allow anybody that you choose to can see what your device is doing without having to see your credit card number or anything like that. So let me go to a shared View screen. Here we go. Share my screen. So this is what it could look like. This particular device, um, at the bottom it says MIRI-12 Tracker. That's just the name that we gave it. Um, it was for a project that we actually were doing in Sweden. So oddly enough, it has some data points in Sweden. Um, I'm going to zoom in on the data points that are in Minnesota. So here we go. Let me zoom in. And what I can see here is that it appears this device has been used for perhaps two different balloon flights. 
one of which started near St. Peter. And if I just hover over this, I can see that the date of these data points is 3-19-23, so 19th of March. And then here, this is 4-8-23, so the 8th of April, 2023, one year in advance of a second eclipse, if you're paying attention to that sort of thing. And uh, each of these data points gives a timestamp. So here we go. This is 1.35 in the afternoon, and then here is 1.41 in the afternoon, and then here's 1.46. So every five minutes, I get data. And notice once in a while, I probably missed a data point here. So you don't maybe get every single five-minute data point. If I were to um, just tell it I'm interested only in, how about data from 4.7.2023? up to 4, 9, 2023, show. Okay, so now it's just showing one of those two flights, not both. Um, this particular flight was launched from here. Let's go and zoom in and take a look at the details from the launch. And what I'll notice is, clearly I turned it on a while before we let go of the balloon because I have a bunch of data points, perhaps every five minutes as it was being handled and carried around. Also notice that some of these data points seem to lie above a building. Don't take that too seriously. Basically, I was not on the roof of the building. It just is that on its map, the location of the building and then the uncertainty of the location of the device happened to overlap. And so it looks like I was on the building. I was not, I was in the parking lot. If I go to this icon right here, this is the map icon. And I can choose, instead of seeing a map, I can choose a satellite image. These are the only two I ever use. There I can see the building and I can see the parking lot. And in fact, we were to the north of the building and then we let go. So if I zoom back out again, notice that it didn't actually ping in the air until I was all the way up here. So maybe five minutes or so after we let go. And if I zoom out even farther, it went to the north, it went to the east, it started going to the southeast. It's a little hard to see the dots, I think, if you're in that view. So if I go back to map view, I can see more easily where it traveled. And then let's see where this landed. I consider this device rather useful for finding things after they've landed, but not that useful for tracking them while they're in flight for two reasons. One reason is they don't update very often. And the second reason is they give latitude longitude, but you cannot count on their altitude. For instance, take a look at this. If I hover over here, it says 28,000 feet for altitude. And then if I go here, it says, ah, close that, 32,000 feet for altitude. And then I go here and it says 1,100 feet for altitude. That's not true. I was definitely still up there at that time, hopefully still ascending. And so often, not just sometimes, but very often the altitude values are bad. Not sure why. So count on this for latitude, longitude. Don't count on it for altitude. What that does mean, though, is it's hard to tell if something's still flying because you can't tell if it's off the ground or not. So let me go back to, the, let me go to the tail end of this flight. So in this particular case, I got one data point here at, well, let's see, I got a data point here at 228. And then there was kind of a long pause and I got another data point here at 244. So well over five minutes later, but this is really important. I got more than one data point here. That means it has landed. This is how to tell if the device has landed is, does it repeat its location more than once, meaning it's not still moving. And if I look at this, I can see one of these was at 249. One of these was at three, three o'clock. So 10 minutes later, 249, there's one in the middle. Here's another thing that's at 254. So basically, every five minutes after it locked after landing, it might not have locked right away after landing, but once it locked after landing, it gave me several data points, and then it realized, oh, wait a minute, I'm not moving, and it actually stopped transmitting. So getting those last three data points was really critical. Also, here's another valuable thing. If I go to satellite high res, I can see a few things. One is it's not only close to a road, but it's in an open field. That's very good. It's not in trees, although there were some trees just to the west of it. And interestingly enough, down toward the bottom and off to the left-hand side of this picture, you can actually see wind turbines. So it landed in the area that had a whole bunch of wind turbines, but it didn't happen to interfere with any of them either. 
So this was an easy thing to recover. Um, okay, so one more time, you can select the, the data set. You can set this on live. In other words, where are you right now? And in this case, it just tells me where it last knew it was, but this was actually a long time ago. This was back in April and now it's May. Um, or you can say what was happening in the last one hour or the last 24 hours or the last seven days or the last one month. And in my case, this was not used even as recently as a month ago. So it still only shows one single data point. Let's talk a little bit about how to set up such a device when you first get it. So first of all, let me stop sharing and just show you what it looks like when you get the box. So there it is. There's the box. It says spot trace on it. And um, if I open up the box, this is important. You need to get some numbers, and those numbers are inside the box. So there's the device in the box. There are the batteries. Use lithium batteries. And here is what looks like an instruction manual. And it is an instruction manual, but this is very important. On the back side of the instruction manual, it has the key numbers, which it won't zoom. There it is. The ESN number and the AUTH number, the authorization number and the device ID number called ESN. OK, you need those numbers so that you can log in and activate the device. That's sort of evidence that you actually have the device in hand, and presumably it belongs to you. So this is my brand new device. and I made a, an account for this device. I'll show it to you. I haven't put batteries in it, so there's no data in my account at all. But let me just go to that account in a moment. So back to sharing my screen. You want to go to findmespot.com, F-I-N-D-M-E-S-P-O-T dot C-O-M, OK? And then you want to log in. So I've already done that. So here I log in and it tells me, oh, I see a device. We decided to name this device UMN-NEBP, University of Minnesota NEBP device. Um, on this screen, I can see the ESN number. I can see the authorization code number. But you can't get to this screen if you don't have those numbers to establish the connection in the first place. And this is in the My Devices area. And if you had several devices, they would all be listed here. Here's something that I think is kind of important. When you uh, first get the device, it often will say you need to update the firmware. And so <laughs> I don't know how to do that, but it can't be that hard. There's a cable inside of the box. And I typically will tell my students, here, go update the firmware. And they come back and say, that was easy. Um, you have to subscribe to it. So what I've chosen to do with this one is in early May of 2023, I subscribed for a full year. Now, this is important. When you subscribe to this device, you have to pay several different fees. The first fee is to turn it on or to activate its service. And then the second fee is to subscribe for a certain amount of time, typically either one month or one year. And often they make you sign up for auto pay, but you can turn that off again once you've signed up. And then you can also, if you choose to, sign up, I believe, for what's called Flex. And flex means pay a little bit of money up front, and then they don't charge you the reactivation fee if you happen to lapse. So if you know you're going to use it for an eclipse in October and in April, you might imagine signing up just for October and paying the flex fee, which allows you to have one month in October and then get it back in April for one more month without paying the activation fee over again. On the other hand, my recommendation is sign up for a whole year because there will be test flights before the first eclipse. If you're in the eclipse program, there'll be test flights between the eclipses possibly. And after one full year, you can decide if you're gonna continue the subscription or not. I suspect you will. Um, I use this as kind of a backup device. Basically, I have trackers that tell me altitude as well as latitude, longitude, and they tell me really what's happening. And only if things aren't going well in my other tracking systems do I turn to the spot and say, oh, by the way, backup device, just help me out here. Help me at least find the thing. Or backup device, tell me whether it's landed in the forest or landed in the field or landed in the water, um, just so I kind of know how to approach it if I'm not there when it lands and I want to figure out how to plan my recovery. On this page, here's something that I think is kind of interesting and important, and that is status message. There's a bunch of things you can turn on and off. You can read about them in the user guide. My recommendation is you take the status message, which is disabled when it arrives, and turn that on. Enable status message. 
oh, my session is expired. Too bad. Um, actually, that's that is bad because I wanted to show you a few other things. I will log back in. One moment. So I called this M N S G S P O T S. That was my login and. Password. Okay, I'm back to my devices. And I was in the process of turning on the status message. Enable. Successful. That's good. So what the status message does is it will transmit information once a day, even if it's not moving. Because once it stops moving, it will stop transmitting altogether. And so the reason this is useful, I think, is because if you lose something and you just can't find it, hey, check back tomorrow. Maybe it will have shown up. This actually happened to me in Sweden. Oddly enough, we lost the device in the woods and um, it showed up several days later. So apparently it was trying to connect and it took several days for it to actually connect. And once it connected, we were actually able to go back to the location and recover the device, which had gone missing. And part of the reason it went missing is because it didn't reconnect immediately. In fact, it took more than a day to reconnect but we had the status message enabled, which turned out to be important. So um, if I go to maps, it will show me information about the device, including where it's located. And right now this device is brand new, never, no batteries, nothing. So there's no data here, but it looks similar to what I was showing you for the shared view. And the reason I want to go here is I want to point out that by clicking on this icon, shared views, you can establish a shared view. Okay, so if I click on that and it says, well, create a shared view, yes. And the answer is yes, I want to do that. So here, for instance, is the shared view um, for this device. I've established one already. And so there's a link. And if I give this link to anybody, then that person can take a look at where this device is. You might not be interested in other people watching your spot. I think you should be interested. I'm definitely interested. So for people who aren't on the flight, but want to know what I'm up to, they can keep tabs on the spot device if they, as well as other things that are perhaps online. So I think shared view is really important. It's also important as I share it among my students, among my team, so that people know where to go. And so it's like, after the thing has landed, we're on our phones, it's like, yep, it's landed, it's north of this highway such and such, and it seems to be on the other side of a creek, so make sure you come in from the west. Um, that's the sort of thing that, Spot tracking can help you with, and shared view allows everybody to pitch in. So that's what I've got for spot tracking. Um, a very useful device. It's <laughs> it saved us more than once. Um, in fact, I have a few of them, and um, you just have to keep subscribing to them. My recollection is the subscription is in the order of $15, $20 per month, and then about 10 times that per year. And the device itself might might cost $150 or something like that. So there's some upfront cost, but then you have to subscribe to keep it running. On the other hand, if this is what keeps you from losing $1,000 worth of equipment, it's definitely worth it. 